Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome to another Investors Chronicle Interviews podcast. I'm Dan Jones, the Deputy Editor of the IC, and joining me today is Abby Glenny, Deputy Head of Smaller Companies at Aberdeen. Abby is co-manager of the UK Smaller Companies Strategies at the Asset Manager, including the Aberdeen UK Smaller Companies Growth Trust and its open-ended fund equivalent. So, as that implies, we are going to spend our time today talking about domestic small cap shares. Uh, Not a happy hunting ground for many over the past couple of years, but at the same time, there's no doubt that valuations are attractive and that some of those valuations are starting to attract more attention from predators, from other businesses and from investors in general. At the same time, as is always the case, there are still plenty of success stories out there too. So we will be looking at some of the options available and discussing more besides. Abby, welcome to the show. Good to have you here. Hi, Dan. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure. We'll jump straight in because there's a lot of issues with the UK market at the moment. Talked about ad nauseum maybe, but we're going to talk about it a little bit more now. We'll start with some of the issues I just alluded to, the general malaise perhaps around the UK market, the the small cap market in general. What do you make of that? Is it just an interest rate story, a higher interest rate story? Are you concerned about the market in general? I know this is quite a doom and gloom start, but what's your take on all these issues that have been percolating for the last 24 months or so? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I'd say when you go into the details of the opportunities and, you know, the ability to construct a portfolio within the UK market, you know, definitely doesn't feel like doom and gloom. But what we've seen in terms of UK market levels and attractions has been both disappointing and in an extended way. And I think that, you know, it's very well known and we talk about a lot that the UK market is not the UK economy. So even in small cap, you know, about half the revenue is generated overseas. And actually, you know, if we look at the sort of macro top down situation of the UK at the moment, it's not disastrous. It is, you know, sort of positive GDP. Okay, it's a bit lackluster, but the recession element so far, you know, seems really like a non-event. And actually, I think someone, I read a quote last week, which says, if this is a recession, then we need to redefine what a recession is. And, you know, I do agree with that. So mm. I think from where we are in terms of valuation, so if you if you don't have already an investment in this sort of space at the moment, as a starting point, the valuation element is definitely there. I think that's proved to not be enough in its own right. But what we are seeing is, I think the allocation, you know, the level of outflows out of UK equities and in particular UK smaller companies in the past few years has been really difficult in terms of, I think, compounding a lot of that negative uh, market level pressure that we've had. And so I think that is something that you know, if we start to see those outflows abate and hopefully inflow territory, I think that can actually have quite a powerful a- aspect in terms of some of the attractive return opportunities that are there. And I think one of the key highlights for me is that you know people look at the sort of headline GDP growth of the UK and you know, it's not exactly buoyant and there are other regions doing doing higher. But when you look at actually what the companies are reporting, you know, companies are reporting really strong results. And they are now, I would say, on improving territory if we look at sort of upgrades versus downgrades. And if I look at the earnings growth of the portfolios that I run in the small cap space, they've both been resilient growth and at attractive levels. So you know, I think we're looking at sort of pretty solid high single digit earnings growth outlook from the portfolio. Mm, there's no doubt. I think this result season as well from what we've seen that uh, you're right, a lot of resilience is in evidence and a lot of companies operationally are doing very well. There is that question of flows though and the the UK government is getting in on the act of course with the uh, announcement last week of the potential UK ISA and there's the Edinburgh reforms package before that as well. What what do you make of these initiatives as a way to boost supply and demand dynamics? Do you think they'll help? Do you think some of them need to be focused in different areas? How do you feel about those? I think that they are absolutely positive and a positive signal of intention. I think what we've heard so far in its own right is absolutely not a silver bullet. So, 
No, I think Brysa is a is a great idea. We've seen some really successful types of schemes in other regions. So, uh, you know, the scheme in, J in Japan that they have, the Nippon ISA, uh, France have the PEA plan, and it also has a, an additional section uh, focused on smaller companies. Um, you know, I think there has been success on those things. I think if we look at the sort of Brysa headlines and the the five thousand pound level. Um, you know, that, that's likely to not be enough to make a big difference. I guess because, you know, I talked about those outflows, you know, stock markets are often driven by the incremental buyer or seller. And given we've come from this big outflow dynamic over the past couple of years, I think any incremental buyer actually, you know, has the potential to make a difference to, to stock price returns. And that in itself can create a more positive aspect and sort of a more positive cycle of investment. I think one of the things that you know I hear a lot about in terms of reform though that we need to do more of would be some of the pension reform. So I guess we started to see the, the beginnings of that last year last week in terms of disclosures, but you know, not action. Um, is there some sort of a, a underlying threat in there maybe? Um, in terms of, you know, you know, you're being asked to disclose, there is somewhat of an expectation. Um, I think if we look at some of the the local government pension schemes, though, which are sizable in assets, I think there's about three hundred and fifty billion pounds of assets in that space. You know, that is somewhere that the government do have more control. It seems like could be more persuasive. So might we see them do anything there? And I think the other thing that I would like to see more action on is just the level of sort of regulatory uh, pressure, compliance, the costs involved in both being a listed business and also an investor in terms of the high level of stamp duty costs we have in the UK are both areas that I would like to see the, the government focus on. Mm. Um, I think one of the positive things, just you know, we're in a we're in a year of elections all over the world. And I think actually when we look at what Labour Party have said around, you know, their focus on this area, I think actually people are quite aligned. So I don't see the change of government's risk as sort of unsettling progress on this. Yeah. And perhaps when we think as well about the uh, monetary policy picture, that could be another boost in sentiment for the UK too, if those interest rate cuts come through and, and can start to turn the corner on that uh mm that morale in the market, shall we say? Yeah, I think definitely for equities, you know, you would very much hope that's the case. And if we look, we've done a lot of analysis, obviously, on where um, smaller companies is placed in a interest rate cutting environment. And, you know, history is not always the, the predictor of future. But what we've seen in the past is that small and mid caps tend to do well and outperform large caps in that environment. Mm. Well, let's turn to the portfolios themselves now. In amongst all this happening, First of all, I'd be interested to hear about allocation changes in recent months, buys, sells, that kind of thing. And also taking a step back, maybe what have turnover levels been like relative to history in this context of a difficult market and uh, things like that? How, how have you reacted in short? Okay, so turnover levels historically in the trust and the open-ended vehicle tend to be what I think is reasonably low. We take a longer term approach to investment. So over the long term, those have been sort of nearer the 15% level. I think what we do always see is that turnover is a bit lumpy, and that can come from two things. It can just come from the generation of, of new ideas, um, and it can also come from some element in terms of you know, small cap liquidity, and it can sometimes take a bit of time to get in and out of stocks as well. Um, at the moment, I would say if we look over the past six months, turnover would have been a bit higher. You know, so you're talking more like the 20, 25 percent level. Mm. And that's been a positive thing, I would say, though, because that's really been driven by new idea generation that we've had. So it, it's a good sign, actually, that you know we think we're finding some great investment opportunities in the, the UK market. And that creates a really healthy competition for capital within the fund. So we definitely had uh, more ideas in the past six months. That has meant that we have, you know, exited some holdings as well. So we don't have a one in one out policy, but, you know, we tend to keep holdings in the sort of 50 to 55 level. And um, so really trying to back some of our best ideas as well and not have too long a tail. Yeah, I think we'll, you know, we'll, we'll drift back, I think, to that sort of 15 to 20 percent turnover level over the long term. Mm. 
And what about some of those holdings then? What are some of those that have, that have gone? What are some of those that have joined the portfolio? So some of those which have joined the portfolio, I would say, are actually quite diverse in nature. So they definitely do not draw you to you know, any specific themes or sectors, I don't think. So we've purchased, for instance, a holding in Premier Foods, which you know, historically has had trouble periods, but is in a much better, healthy, resilient growth situation. Now we believe with a good balance sheet again and, and no longer a sort of pension overhang. Things like Clarkson, which is global leader in shipbroking, and there's a really strong decarbonisation story as well on that stock. Um, and actually, uh, we did a lot of work on the house builder space. And one of the stocks that we've bought is actually Cairn Homes, which is the Irish house builder, uh, which is dual listed. And I think we got a lot of comfort that the underlying fundamentals in that house building space, the support from the government there, the forward funding programs they have, the really attractive return on capital employed made that uh, a very um, attractive investment for us. And when we look at some of the things that we sold, uh, they sit in a few different camps, I would say. So we have had some things which have been bid for. So, for instance, we would have had bids in Ergomed uh, last year, which we would have moved on from. Uh, smart metering systems as well, we held, which was bid for. We have also sold that one. And then we've moved on from some holdings which have had a more troubled period. So, for instance, we moved on last year from Watches of Switzerland. Uh, we've also moved on from XP Power. Uh, similarly, Marshalls, which I still think is a great quality business, but which has gone through an, I would say, an elongated tough period. So the, the downturn for them has lasted longer than we would have expected. Yeah. We'll come back to some of the individual stock positions, but I wanted to talk a bit about the valuation process and the screening process as well, how you find these companies, how you, you rate them. Uh, why don't we start by taking a further step back and thinking about uh, your predecessor on the, the trust, Harry Nimmo. Do you effectively employ the same valuation processes and, and thinking that he did in terms of how you value shares and look at sectors? Uh, and or has that process changed a bit again during this difficult period we've seen for small caps over the past couple of years? Yeah. So... Nothing has really changed with, with Harry's retirement. We are actually part of a global smaller companies team. So within the team, we run UK, European and global uh, small and mid-cap funds. And we all run exactly the same investment process. And, you know, that is essentially the process that Harry started 25 years ago in the UK. And I'm sure we'll talk about the matrix more, but which has the stock screening tool of the matrix um, fully embedded in it. So that process is focused around quality, growth and momentum. And we continue to follow that. Now, the last couple of years has obviously been a more macro top down environment. And you know, we as more fundamental stock pickers tend to prefer to operate in a market where people are focused more on company fundamentals. So that has led to it being challenging for us in terms of the market being driven by that change in interest rate and inflation. I think within that situation, you have to be more conscious about some of those the dominance of those macro drivers but we've absolutely done that while staying within the quality growth momentum process you know you have definitely had to be more conscious of of some valuations i would say and um, within that period but also you know quality has been so important to companies who have actually proved resilient and and who also have still grown their earnings in that environment you mentioned the matrix screen there can you say a bit more about this? You know, the, this is, as you say, an Aberdeen proprietary screen, but can you say a little bit about what kind of things it looks for, what kind of metrics it concentrates on? Uh, we, of course, have our own screens at the IC as well, so I'd be interested to, to get a little bit of insight into what kind of things you look for. Yeah, sure. So, um, like I said, the matrix has really, you know, existed for us for 25 years and have been broadly unchanged in that period. We have changed some factors, um, but I would say the changes have been quite limited. And the matrix is really focused around being able to identify what it thinks are companies that fit our investment process. And therefore, you would expect that to be aligned to quality growth and momentum, which it absolutely is. So the UK matrix is made up of 12 factors. Um, these are all data that we bring in externally. 
Um, those, I mean, those factors are essentially within buckets. So we have a valuation bucket, we've got quality, we've got growth, we've got dynamic earnings momentum, and that is quite important as a, as a driver. And, you know, those factors, we work with uh, Laura Udikaniku, who works on our quants team and, and uh, is in charge of the matrix. And what's really important is that actually there is some separation and some independence in some ways. So, you know, the factors and the weightings that are put into the matrix are not selected by Harry or any of the rest of us. You know, they have been done in terms of back testing of which factors and what combination of those factors drives the best total return. And so I think there's a really good linkage to clients there. Um, how do we use it? So we use it in a few different ways. We use it, I would say, for screening for new ideas. So, you know, we're always looking at things that have improving matrix scores or consistent matrix scores in the sort of top two quintile buckets. Uh, we also use it though in terms of portfolio construction. So you, know, you would want us to be weighting the, the larger positions in the portfolio should be higher matrix scores on, on average. And similarly, you know, the things with lower matrix scores, we would hope to be smaller constituents. And those are the ones that also were always challenging in terms of cell discipline. That brings me to my next question about the sort of the freedom you have to go against the matrix. I mean, it sounds like we're talking about some virtual reality here or some different universe, yeah. but the the freedom you have to choose shares outside uh, this screen or that the mm -hmm. screen might disagree with you on. From the sounds of it, you do have the, uh, that liberty, but how often does that happen? And, you know, how do you how do you test those contradictions, if you will? Yeah, so... I mean, Laura would always be clear that, you know, this is a tool for us to use and to sort of empower us with insights and data. It is not meant to be, you know, a full decision-making tool. We're not running a quant fund. So it's all about taking those insights and combining them with the fundamental analysis. And um, we absolutely can, you know, continue to hold some stocks where the matrix score might have dipped negative. And our job as analysts and fund managers is to challenge why negative and what we think in the investment case is going to change that's going to improve that. Um, your know, valuation is embedded in the matrix. So I like that in terms of it looks at sort of value holistically as part of the investment process. And in different cases, we might look at different types of, of valuation dynamics as well that aren't in the matrix. So for instance, depending on what's happening with that company, I might be interested in uh, some of the parts argument. I might be interested in peer multiples and historic multiples at different points in a cycle. I think that where it's really useful, like I said, is the cell discipline. So really things that have a consistently negative sto scoring stock, we really have to have a very strong view of why that changes or why that pos that position in some dynamic, and you know this might involve the risk tools as well, has a place in the portfolio. Because we do like to be longer term investors, so we are willing to look through some short-term weakness in companies. Where I think we try not to be from the matrix though is that particularly if we're buying a new idea, you know, I would really want that to have a, a sort of solid, sustained, positive matrix score. Mm. Well, let's turn to some individual companies in a bit more detail now, specifically some of those uh, which are the largest positions in the, the fund and trust. Uh, I'll start with Bytes Technology because it is an interesting company, uh, Microsoft reseller, as you may want to term it, its share price has done very well as Microsoft's has. Do you see it as a, a good UK proxy for Microsoft? Is it more complicated than that? And equally, its its own valuation uh, by some metrics has surpassed Microsoft's own in, in recent months. Is, is that a an issue for you or do you look at it in a slightly different way? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that they would like to, to say that they're definitely more than just Microsoft, but Microsoft is by far their biggest partner. You know, these guys are a real value add reseller and we've seen them grow market share significantly since they first listed and that's been a real positive. You know, I think if if we, you know, I don't look at the US names in detail, but I think if you look at Microsoft, you actually see that there's, there's mixed areas of the business. So one of the positives, I guess, of Bytes is that its exposure is actually to the sort of fastest growing areas of Microsoft and those which you might thematically think about. So things like, you know, cloud, the growing subscription base, things like Azure and AI Copilot, which, you know, gets a lot of, of media attention. Mm. So I think it's exposed to the, the best areas of Microsoft. 
think that AI elements, you know, we've seen AI as a big driver negatively and positively of a lot of stocks. And I think that will take some years to, to play out really, but they will absolutely benefit because you know, they are monetizing that, that AI exposure directly. That is a paid for product from Microsoft. You know, Bytes definitely is the cleanest play on both Microsoft and AI that I think we have in UK small cap. And you think, therefore, the the valuation, uh, maybe I'm surprised because sometimes, you know, it can be difficult for a UK company to achieve a good valuation, but you think, therefore, that's justified and that can have room to grow further? Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the sort of other peers that I actually look at the valuation often is in the context of we have three players listed in that space in the UK. We've got Byte, Softcat and Computer Centre. Mm. I think all have interesting investment cases in their own right. Bytes is definitely you know, the most highly rated of those though. So, you know, for me, it's really about judging a few things. And I would highlight one, the growth aspects. And, you know, I think that's where I was trying to pull out actually, it's it's exposed to the highest growth aspects of Microsoft. And, and also just to the like quality and resilience that Bytes has, because especially compared to those others, you know, it's really a, a pure software exposed play. So the revenue visibility they have and, and sort of quality of earnings, I think, is very high, which helps sustain operating. Another share in which is a decent sized position around 4% is for imprint, which is one of these stocks that's come to more people's attention recently. It's certainly a favorite of, I think, the fund manager community in general. Can you talk a bit about the business? Because we've spoken about it before on our other podcast sometimes. It's a relatively simple business model that seems to be done very well promotional goods seller is a, is a way to sum up the company what, what do you like about it uh, but also what do you see as its competitive edge because it does seem like a relatively straightforward business as i say yeah yeah it's um i think that's been one of the aspects which has surprised a lot of uk investors actually is the quality of the business because i think people don't really understand often the quality of it because they see the end product you know promotional materials in the us so your branded pens and water bottles and things and they see that as just a sort of low quality you know quite commoditized market probably and i think it's really taken us you know we've owned this business for many many years and i think you have to look at what sort of a, a stock and what sort of a business model it has within that and actually you know i i sort of hate to use the word in the context but it really is more like a platform stock in terms of how they operate and how they can drive good margins and then sort of not have to touch every part of that value chain so they're also operating in a very fragmented market so that's key you know they have taken a lot of market share consistently they're still only at five percent of the market and the market is you know huge in the us so i think there is a continued opportunity there and and maybe that's one of their differentiators actually is just that in a market that is made up of you know small mom and pops scale matters and i think where we've seen that really come through for them is their investment in marketing so they sort of started this just before covid then for obvious reasons paused on in covid and that's really come back again the past couple of years and i think that's what investors who maybe didn't own foreign print have underestimated is the really attractive return on marketing that they've generated that I think they'll continue to generate. Um, you know, they've invested in the customer service as well to make sure that they can support those increased growth rates. And I think the quality and the sort of return purchase they've gained from these new customers is really important. I think also it is a low capital requirement business with great cash generation. So this thing really throws off cash. And if we look at, at I think people expect there to do sort of maybe about seven, eight percent um growth from here, you know, they have achieved higher growth than that pre-COVID without the benefit of the marketing investment. So, you know, I still think we can see upgrades to to earnings for this. And if you look at the amount of cash it can throw off, you know, it consistently pays good dividends and special dividends. And um, so I think in a total return context. It's really attractive. And you're coming back to valuation. I think it's a, it's a bit of a higher multiple than, than pre-COVID, but not significantly. Yeah, one of those where the earnings have, have carried on growing as well. I'm going to continue jumping around and, and ask about the largest absolute position, if not the largest relative, albeit it's up there as well. That's Hill & Smith. This is a company we've, uh, as we record, we've just finished uh, discussing on another podcast, which uh, will have been out for a time. Uh, listeners hear this one on our Companies and Market Show podcast. Uh, Hill and Smith, 
it's a business that is benefiting a lot from a strong U.S. market. It's making a lot of acquisitions over there as well. Uh, two strands to this question. One is how do you consider uh, acquisitive companies like th this? It's clearly a buy and build model, but does that make it harder in some ways to to work out which acquisitions are working, which aren't, or does that increase the risk that a, a bad acquisition could go overlooked until it's too late? Um, and the other question is, because the US makes up about three quarters of operating profit, could this be a company that's looking to, to move its listing over overseas to the US? We, I think we summed up on the other podcast that it may be a bit too small for that to happen right now, but it could happen in future. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well, maybe I'll take the second part of the question first. So in terms of the listing, this is one that I absolutely do not think is on their agenda. I have never had a conversation with them about, uh, or I have asked, but I've never had any intention from them of wanting to list in the US. I think they're quite happy with their UK listing. Mm. You know, absolutely, that's not the case with every company. So, you know, I do have those discussions with others. But I think that actually, you know, they still have a, a decent exposure in terms of their business here. Um, their HQ is still here, etc. But importantly, I don't think they think they're missing out on anything by being UK listed. You know, this is a business mm. which has performed really well. And actually, I think if you look at some of the US peer valuations in this sector for Hill and Smith, Hill and Smith probably actually has a better valuation than some of those US companies, which is very different to what a lot of other companies might argue. Um, so no, I think we will firmly see these guys be UK listed. Um, on the second part, yeah, so the acquisition element. So, you know, we do invest in businesses which are acquisitive. We really want to see that supported though by good organic growth across the business. And also with them, you know, really integrating the businesses that are required back into the group, whether that be, and maybe, you know, sometimes all the businesses are integrated fully into you know, the whole group. Sometimes, you know, it's really within divisions. Um, and I think that Helen Smith definitely will still be acquisitive. And I think that's, you know, I would want them to be with the balance sheet they have, cash generation, and importantly, the, the opportunities. So you know, I think that's a positive side of the investment case. Um, I actually think, so at the moment, we've got a, a sort of exec chair in there, Alan Geddes. And you know, I think Alan has done a great job in terms of looking at both the acquisitions and the disposals. You know, so definitely... He has picked up on some cases that maybe acquisitions that they've done before haven't been the right fit or performed as well as they they would have liked. You know, he is not scared of taking action to to dispose of those, which I like, and redeploy that capital in. And you know, we've also seen him continue to do acquisitions, you know, in his seat as exec chair as well. And I think that's really important because we're going through a great demand period in the US, and you really want them to be able to sort of capture as much of that upside as possible. Do you think that demand is coming through already? Uh, the figures suggest so. It's certainly performing well. But we, we've seen with some of the infrastructure money, like with some other big high profile acts in the US, the CHIPS Act as well, that some of that money doesn't come through as quickly as people think to begin with because it needs to be uh, tied up with federal funds as well. Do you think that is starting to come through? And do you think that will continue to come through? Or is there a risk of uh, people getting ahead of themselves, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think we are already seeing it a bit in terms of the, the sort of growth that Hillsmith's delivering and, um, you know, also the earnings upgrades that it's, it's seen as well to a degree. But I think that actually we've got a long pathway of still that benefit to flow through. And part of that is really because of, you know, what Hillsmith do and where they often sit in that in that chain, they tend to be later cycle in these projects. So, you know, one of the things that gives me a lot of confidence in the outlook and why it is, you know, one of the biggest positions for us is that I think we've got visibility of really strong leading indicators. And if you look at some of this sort of new construction work stats, um, you know, I think that those give you a lot of confidence looking out over the next few years. Is that because of the nature of the business, uh, you know, there are product suppliers, so they're not building the projects but they're feeding into them is that why there's sort of later stage in that regard yeah exactly so you know they are not going to be the people that are there on selling into that on on day one of these new projects and like you said you know you're completely right these are multi-year investment cycles that the the government are supporting and um, so that's good because it's sort of continued long-term visibility and investment and um, but also yeah because of because of what they do they'll tend to be 
you know to the middle to back end weighted often in a lot of these these projects mm. one company we should talk about it's faring less well at the moment is cvs group the veterinarian chain business now clearly there's been this threat of the cma investigation which has become more of a reality this week as we record with the the news that it's moving ahead with that investigation what's your take on the business in that context because i think some people were thinking or hoping that uh, the initial look at the sector by the uh, this is the competition and markets authority would be the end of it clearly now it's going further how does that affect cvs clearly the uh, reaction this week hasn't been good how does it affect the investment case from your perspective yeah, so you know, I've spent a lot of time this week on on calls with vet experts and people who've done a lot of, of digging into the the report that you know we've seen so far. And um, I think it's really disappointing that uh, we're getting a sort of full investigation, but perhaps really should not be entirely surprised about it, just given some of the wording that the CMA have used before. And um, I think that in a share aspect, unfortunately, what these things tend to do is they tend to just put a uh, big overhang in terms of you know, new investors who often uh, don't want to come into a stock when we have this sort of likely 18 month timeline on this CMA review. So I think that is a puts a bit of a ceiling, let's say, on what we can expect from CVS in that period. Your know, shares are what down 20% now and 20% when we had the first announcement of the, the initial investigation. So the shares are really reflecting a lot of negativity and actually you know, fundamentals and what I think as well, the business will be able to do over, even over an 18 month review period, I think aren't as bad as, as that is reflective. So what do I think they might do? You know, I think in the short term, they, they might be not putting up prices any, certainly any more than costs is my best guess. But I think that hasn't been a big part of the, the growth story anyway, in the past few years. And that's probably something the CMA really don't, don't understand. I think that we will probably see deals, any acquisitions being done far more selectively. Um, I think if you look at the other big players in the UK who are PE owned, you know, they are mm. parts of much more global businesses. So you probably just see, well, to be honest, a lot of them, they are quite highly levered anyway. So with interest rates where they are, you know, they are generally investing less anyway at the moment, but you could see them just focus on regions outside the UK a bit more. Um, so actually create less competition in some ways for deals, but I think one thing that maybe people don't speak a lot about is CVS actually have a, a really good and emerging Australian business. So I think there are still other really attractive growth opportunities they can have in, in the meantime as well. And the group of them together, I guess, have already suggested some remedies which don't seem to go far enough in, um, in the view of the CMA. But I think we will get some things that are around transparency. And I don't think that those will really cause a a fundamental issue in terms of customer demand for CVS. Um, I think that we will, um, you know, one of the topics I guess that was announced is around the sort of drug pricing comments. Mm. Um, I think what you see in other geographies though is that where drug pricing is lower, the services cost of that is higher. So, um, you know, these guys are earning a sort of 20% margin on that business, I think. You know, this isn't a significantly super normal margin. Um, and I think the other thing that's a bit, I struggle a bit to see what the CMA will do is just on some of the sort of referral services and crematorium things. Um, you know, it's hard to, if you don't want these main players to own those, I just don't know who's going to, you know, who are the obvious other buyers of those. Um, and actually I had a, a really good um, expert call today where um, the this vet expert was talking about the challenges that the vet industry has had and actually how disappointing this is for vets on you know vets in terms of morale in terms of certainty in terms of planning in what is a business that we've really come a long way in the past few years to to sort of increase the supply of vets so it is disappointing all around do you think uh, divestments could be on the agenda uh, and also given the 18 month overhang potentially are you prepared to hold on and wait through that period effectively with the position. Yeah, so uh, divestments, I do think divestments might be part of the remedies that um, I don't know if they've already been offered, but you know, that might be asked for. Interestingly, someone raised on a question today, could we see some swapping of assets? Because I think that's one of the big challenges. This isn't necessarily a national um, view from the CME. I think it's much more localized. 
Um, so could we see some swapping of assets between these main players in the space lo on local levels, possibly? And yeah, our, our view on holding on to shares. So we still are holding on to our CVS shares in our funds. Um, we haven't sold, sold those at all because of the review yet. Um, but I think we definitely have to take a, a view in terms of there's probably a, a cap on a return over the next 18 months, given this overhang. Um, so I think for us, we, we sort of don't want to commit to holding it right through that period. but um, at the moment, we're, we're not taking any action and we're going to see what, what pans out and what we feel is sort of in terms of what's priced in at these sort of levels. Mm. Another sector I wanted to discuss is the food producer sector. You have uh, Cranswick in the fund and Hilton Food Group as well. Cranswick is probably a higher quality business, not to say Hilton isn't, but just in terms of the, the metrics that, that they achieve there. Hilton has been through some ups and downs do you think it can get to a level where it's seen as a similar kind of business quality-wise as Cranswick? Maybe you see it that way already, or do you see it more as a recovery story for now, given some of the issues it's had in recent years? Yeah, so, I mean, I think these are both fascinating businesses, and actually the, the best site visit day that me and my co-manager Amanda Yeoman had last year was we went to a Cranswick facility and a Hilton facility in the same day. And, mm. you know, it's quite fascinating to go and see these things in real life and the level of, you know, efficiency that they require. Um, and they are both great quality businesses and both great uh, growth businesses as well. Um, I think they have slightly different, different sort of places to play. So, I mean, Cranswick has, you know, great high returns it's very resilient you know i think it's got is it 30 years of broken um unbroken dividend growth now and i think what they've really done is they have built up that trust and reputation in the industry that you know does help to sustain sustain a rating and you know it is it's higher margin and it's higher return and um, so it probably generates about 17 percent return on capital employed um and the multiple probably you know should reflect that Hilton has lost a bit of that trust, um, which must have been late 2022 when they had some challenges with salmon pricing. Mm. So, you know, I think they, they've been in a period where they've really been earning that back. And we have seen that in terms of share prices really recovered a lot from that period. But their return on capital employed, you know, only uh, around 9 to 10% at the moment, you know, that has been as high as 20. And some of the recent acquisitions they've done have, um, diluted that just in the shorter term. But actually longer term, you know, Cranswick is probably only going to be a UK focused business, whereas Hilton really can be quite a global leader. And therefore you'll go through periods where you know the growth coming out of them, especially as they sign on new customers in new geographies, can be really fast. And it is high quality, you know, with with agreed margins, long term contracts. So actually as you know, as Hilton gets bigger, its opportunities get probably increasingly bigger. Um and new customers can make a real difference at, at group, group level. So I think at the moment, you know, you are seeing Cranswick at a particularly sort of has achieved itself a, a very attractive rating. You know, we don't think that's that's too high. So I think that's sustainable. I think you'll go through a period probably as Hilton starts to improve those return on capital employed and um, goes through a faster growth period that it will see a re-rating on the back of that. Both companies meet processes, Cranswick, of course, pork. Hilton has some packaging services as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has this acquisition, as you say, of a uh, Foppen, I think the, the salmon company, mm -hmm. where it, it did seem that uh, the pricing power there was, was less evident when we had this inflationary spike. It, it couldn't really push through the price increases that uh, peers could. D do you see that acquisition as something that it can benefit from now or is it something it's just drawn a line under and is focusing on other areas how do you see that you know within a matter of months it really in, in resolved that issue and essentially these businesses actually you know in terms of if we look back over long term they are much higher quality in terms of the relationships they have with the customers and the pricing pass-through mechanisms so your Cranswick absolutely has that with the retailers Hilton has always had that on the um, beef side of the business. And actually, I think that's one of the challenges is that probably investors weren't aware enough that because of some of the contracts that had essentially been acquired through the, the fish acquisitions, the quality of those, those um, pricing mechanisms were probably not as high as in the beef. It's also slightly more complex because in the, the, 
the fish, the salmon part of the business, you're running factories where you've got multiple customers coming out of the same production facility. Um, and, you know, the sort of allocation of in that inflationary environment, not just the protein pricing, but the, you know, the overhead costs, the distribution costs, et cetera, um, were, were less well organized, let's say, and they suffered badly from that. But, you know, they did retain all their customers through that. They continued to deliver a good service um, proposition. And I think they will absolutely come back from that. So they are already, you know, they, they took a, a few months to resolve those issues, to renegotiate contracts with customers. I think they're now in a really strong place. We're running uh, short of time, unfortunately, but there are a couple of uh, other topics I wanted to discuss before we wrap up. First of them is uh, something that caught my eye in the half year report for the trust that came out recently, and that was video games companies. Team 17 have been a position, has not done particularly well like many video games companies uh, recently. Uh, a lot of our readers I know as well used to favour these companies and maybe have, have soured on them a little as well. But it, it sounded from the report like that's the sector you're moving away from now a little bit, or certainly with Team 17, which I think you've sold. Can you Can you say a bit about what's change for you in terms of that sector and its prospects yeah so i guess it's probably part of our investment process as well so that's not to say that these stocks don't make interesting investment cases for perhaps other players in the market but for us you know we focus on quality growth momentum and unfortunately the uk video game listed companies and actually you know a lot of global peers and we've seen challenges in the whole industry but have suffered you know, a lot in the past couple of years. Um, and we've seen sort of broader disruption for, for Team 17, who was focused on the sort of uh, lower, um, the lower price games. We've seen price discounting from your big AAA providers. We've seen more competition. We've seen them disappoint essentially. And other UK listed video game stocks as well have suffered even worse for a number of, number of aspects. So it's one for us where, you know, we've seen some of the quality of the, I guess, of the the um, products maybe be called into question a bit. Um, we've just seen a, a lot of mess at the industry, which I think is is quite hard to call um, who, who win and lose on that and how quickly those things normalise. And essentially we've seen, you know, earnings downgrades uh, consistently out of Team 17, unfortunately. Uh, the matrix score was consistently negative. So it no longer fitted our investment process. And like I said earlier, you know, we've actually had a, a lot of what we think are fantastic investment opportunity, new ideas. So we decided to unfortunately move on from that one and redeploy that capital. Mm. What, what are the general rules you have, if any, about firstly position sizing and uh, how far you let positions run? Uh, equally, mm -hmm. target prices for shares, be they high or low, uh, do you subscribe to those very closely or is it a case by case basis? Yeah. Okay. So, um, we tend to hold around 50 to 55 stocks, something like that in the portfolio at any time. That's true for the OIC and the uh, trust top holdings. We tend to run maybe around four and a half percent type level. No, they don't tend to sustain above the sort of 5% holding level. So that's bit of risk control mechanism at the top end there and similarly you know we don't really want a, a trail of of small holdings either so you know realistically any holdings that we have which have been sort of reduced or or have disappointed and are below one percent uh you know for us we've got to be thinking about is that uh you know are we doubling up on that at some point or are we exiting that um we don't have any target prices so i guess we believe that markets are dynamic that you know, there are lots of different factors which we need to take into consideration all the time ongoing in terms of what we think is the right price to, to be paying for a company. Um, so we don't operate target prices. Similarly, we don't have any sort of um, stop losses or anything on on um, things that are disappointing. Um, and new positions, I guess. So it sometimes depends if it's something we we feel we know really well that we're really comfortable with you know sometimes we'll be adding a new position which we actually owned before um in general we would be starting a position at the sort of one one and a half percent level and then as we see that that company continue to trade well to fundamentally do what we think is in the investment case to report positively and hopefully to have earnings upgrades uh we would have more confidence in increasing the position size in that stock. 
And another company that caught my eye in in this context, in a way, is Diploma, because that is now a FTSE 100 company, a testament to its success in many ways. But in a small cap fund, how do you think about companies like that when they are effectively now, by definition, large caps? At what point do you think, well, we need to get rid of this? Or equally, I know you have some flexibility under the mandates and the mandates of the sectors in which your funds and trusts uh are categorized to hold other companies. So are you happy to keep running that as long as the fundamentals warrant it? Or do you think when companies get that big, you think, oh, maybe it's time to, to move on from that now? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Diploma is a good example. So it's sort of more recently been promoted to FTSE 100. Um, you know, I think we do have the ability to, you know, continue to hold a bit of exposure to FTSE 100 within the mandate. Um, I would say that you know, we we have that process of running our winners, so I guess that is where those have have got there. So we would never buy a new FTSE hundred holding, and mm. um, but absolutely, you know, we are a small smaller companies fund, and so we're very aware of of when things get to FTSE hundred, and at the right time, you know, we would be seeing those as a sort of source of capital, and um, but we are not pushed to to sort of jump out of those as soon as those get promoted. So. You know, we can certainly look at the investment case and see where we think it's appropriate to to reduce exposure to those or at some point sell out. But absolutely, you wouldn't expect us to be sort of long term holding FTSE 100 companies, really. And is it the same for mid cap companies or are the lines a bit more blurred there, given no one <laughs> never quite knows what, what the defini- yeah. definition is outside of whether whether they're in the index or not? Yeah, so I think particularly in the UK, actually, I mean, the, the line between small cap and mid cap is very blurred. Um, and that is because most people in in the UK small cap space and certainly us look at the, the sort of NUMIS benchmark. So, you know, our, these funds are both against the NUMIS plus AIM benchmark and NUMIS, NUMIS sort of rebalances once a year in January and in general includes the bottom half on average of FTSE 250. Um, so, you know, things that you might, someone might call mid cap companies are actually, you know, in the small cap universe. So there's definitely more of a blurring there. You know, we do have restrictions within within both around what we can hold off benchmark. So that is absolutely um, sort of controlled in terms of of what we can do. But um, yeah, there's, I guess maybe it's one of the things that has been one of the challenges of the, the UK market, I guess, mm. is just the, the universe and the sort of small versus mid cap actually in terms of market cap. Uh, I don't know, you don't have to go too far before you get to large cap these days. Indeed. On that note, we have unfortunately run out of time. So all that remains to say is thank you very much, Abby, for taking part in this podcast. It's been a good discussion and hopefully our listeners will have found it interesting as well. But thank you very much. Thanks so much. Please do join us next time for another IC Interviews podcast. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.